Yes, in case you're wondering, my nose still does hurt. Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. Today is Wednesday and we are continuing our discussion of Angela's Ashes by Frank McCourt. So uh, if my reading goes well, we will have our final discussion tomorrow on Thursday, and then I'll be analyzing your selection of a myth, a fairy tale, or a Sherlock Holmes short story. One thing that we see sort of consistent between Frank, and this is probably just happenstance, is when he received catechism, when he was finished catechism, and when he was confirmed were two days where he got really sick. One, I think we have a connection there between death and faith. He nearly dies of typhoid on his confirmation day, and he begins to develop a love of literature and poetry in the hospital through a young girl who is like a couple of beds down from him. And uh, we see that continue to grow and develop in him as a person, and apparently even in his younger brothers too. By the time he comes back home, he recovers from being sick. It seems that everybody in the family really enjoys reading, which makes sense for then a writer or someone who loves literature to have that as part of his story. We also see that he really enjoys the time that he has with his father, which is usually in the mornings. He has the mornings just to himself, just him and his father. And he kind of breaks up his father into three identities. He's the man who he sees in the morning, who lights fire, has tea together. We see him as the man who comes home from work. And we see him as the man who doesn't come home from work, but comes home from the pub very drunk and singing about uh, nationalistic songs about Ireland. And I think it really makes sense. He, here he uses religious language to, to describe and try to understand this split identity. So he compares his father to the Holy Spirit in that sort of three persons in one kind of uh, a, a description for how he experiences his father. And I think, you know, having that split identity or identification of the identity is quite common again with children who grow up with parents who are addicts of, of some kind because the person who your parent is when they're on their substance of choice versus who they are when they're not, they're really two different people. And, and he's really struggling with loving his father, not really loving him when he's out obviously drinking alcohol and just really struggling with that conflict that comes with a child who is the child of a parent who has hurt them. We also have in this section, his mother gets sick with pneumonia and we see really how, you know that they're poor, you know that they're living on the edge of a knife, you know that they're just in the most impecunious of circumstances that the slightest thing will push them over the edge. And actually, prior to his mom getting sick with pneumonia, his father ends up going to England to work in the factories because world war, the World War has started in England. And so they're sourcing a lot of labor from Ireland. And a lot of families are actually in their neighborhood having an improvement in their circumstances because of this influx of wealth that's coming into their community from this outside economy, from this war-driven economy. Not so, of course, for the McCourts. And again, we see the mom go through that same cycle of dreaming and hoping and having her hopes disappointed. <laughs> you know, the practical person can't help but look at the situation and go, well, it'd probably be worse when he doesn't have his family directly in front of him. He would probably be even less able to keep it together and have self-control, but hope springs eternal and she just can't help it. Then after a few weeks or months of him being gone in England, she contracts pneumonia and has to go to the hospital and the boys are left kind of scrounging and scrambling and trying to survive in her absence as a caretaker before she goes to the hospital. And by the time, you know, authorities get involved and people figure out that their mom is sick and they're missing school and all of this. We see them sort of have to spend time with their aunt, which is really unpleasant, but their uncle 
is a really pleasant person and Frank really bonds with him. And so we see him kind of like making miniature bonds with these different various father figures, whether it's Mr. Timoney, whether it's his uncle. And then later when he gets a job, uh, he helps his neighbor who carts coal to the various people who order coal from for their homes to keep their homes warm. And um, so he becomes this sort of assistant and he has this great bond with that gentleman as well. And so we see him sort of like forging these bonds. We also have the first figure for Frank McCourt to have a quality educator, somebody who doesn't use knowledge and education as sort of a tool to abuse, to whip, to um, embarrass, to humiliate, but as actually trying to get the kids to have something in their to, to give them a leg up for their future. He, this teacher really understands how to be strict in a fair way. Obviously the type of teaching wouldn't fly in our modern circumstances. There's still, you're gonna get wrapped on the back of the hand or wrapped on your behind, you know, if you don't behave properly or give the right answers, but he's also consistent at least. So instead of it being a force of chaos and humiliation, it's actually, intended to drive them toward having something better for the future. And he works really hard to make sure that, you know, the kids have good enough. So for the kids who don't have shoes, he organizes a raffle so that all of the kids go sell tickets and the kids who don't have shoes can now have shoes. And so we just can see signs of that understanding that the basics need to be met before you can go to higher level things. Actually, this is, I'll just talk about my opinions since I don't have much to say about the novel. But this is something that I think is really true when you think about like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, even when you think about it for your own life and for being a productive person and, a, and a, uh, an effective person. If you don't have your basics down in life, it's a lot harder to build higher level and more complex systems upon it. So if you don't have you know, your sleep schedule right, that you're eating relatively healthy meals on a regular basis. If you're not, you know, making your bed and making sure that your house is in order or your apartment is in order, it's really hard to then go to that next level of being a focused and prepared student, of being an effective worker at your place of a business or even starting a new job. We have a lot of people trying to be entrepreneurs or have solo endeavors in this day and age in this economy. And it's really, really hard to build those higher level things, those things of higher complexity, if you don't have your basics met. And I think that's what the teacher is recognizing and putting, implementing into place by making sure that all of the kids have shoes. It's like, well, what do shoes have to do with, with learning? Well, it's like your feet don't hurt, you're not cold, you're not getting sick, you're not getting you know cuts on your feet. Like you just need these basics before you can move on to the higher level thing. Anyway, so all of that to say that his mom <laughs> gets pneumonia and you see again how just insecure their lives are. Their lives are entirely insecure. Not only are they just completely impoverished and they live in the worst house in this poor, sad, impoverished neighborhood but by the time his mom you know recovers she literally has to go and start begging for the family they've gotten to the point where they've been on the doll they take charity from this particular charitable organization they go to another charitable organization and get money there and finally she's to the point where she has to go to the church steps and start begging and frank is so embarrassed when he realizes this and again we have these questions of identity so at, at an even smaller scale of like who am I in the context of my family? Who am I in the context of my culture? Who am I in the context of the world, right? And so this is at the central circle of that. Who am I in the context of my family? If my mom, I am, you know, the son of a beggar woman. And so that becomes like a new mantle and a new identity that he puts on. When he gets the job, he gets to replace that identity. He is the man of the house. He works. He brings home money for the family. And he does so at the expense of his health. And you can see his mom really struggling with this because she has a great deal of pity for their neighbor who is a fantastic community member for them who's been very loving and kind to them. And yet she doesn't want you know, her son to go blind because of the type of work that he's doing. He ends up getting sort of infections in his eyes and the coal dust really amplifies that uh, problem that he's having. 
And so, you know, then that identity gets taken away from him. And that identity of being the man of the house bringing home money is, you know, 10 times more important when your father is absent in England drinking away the money that he's supposed to be sending home. So those are a few of my thoughts on Angela's Ashes so far. I am going to wrap up this novel tonight. Um, so tomorrow will be our last discussion on it. Yeah, definitely reading memoir is a different experience to reading literature. I'm finding it really, really challenging, honestly. You know, when you do these everyday updates, some books are easier to talk about, some books are harder to talk about, some books um, lend themselves to literary criticism more readily than others. And anyway, until next time, my name is Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile. <laughs>